All right, thank you very much for coming. It is my great pleasure to host you all here for the 2023 From Samples to Knowledge um, HIPAA training course. Um, a big thanks to the facilities of La Jolla Institute for Immunology for allowing us to do that and giving us all the help and support to, um, to get us going. And uh, this meeting in a very large part has been funded by John Zuckerberg Initiative. So I will start by thanking the people who did um, so much to make it happen. Um, Van Pitt, he is the primary reason responsible for why we um, had to drag you here. And um, you're gonna be spending three next days um, sitting in those mildly comfortable chairs. Um, you could have been on the beach or something like that. Um, Yvonne is um, a big force behind the fact that Cupid exists. Um, Fiona, Thibault um, are here. They are part of Cupid team, as well as Alan, who um, uh, is joining us on Zoom, and he performed some um, code wizardry to um, get the new release um, out. Uh, Sarah McArdle is uh, working um, with us here. Um, she is um, a, a big reason why <laughs> this course exists. Um, Mike Nelson is, as always, extremely helpful. Um, Kenneth Kim, our histopathology um, director, uh, is going to tell you a lot about um, pathology that we'll find in, uh, in the slides we're going to be viewing. Uh, Megan Slodin, Lisa Booker, Zainal Sarazi, and our IT department, um, those are people who help to um, grease the wheels of this operation and uh, um, make sure that there is some food to eat and that with good winds, there's some internet. Um, Kasia Dobachewska, Brett Lafay, Natalia Da Silva, Dil Kiosis, Simon Goldman, and all former members of the course. Some of them are here in the audience as well. Um, thank you very much. Um, this is your work. Um, Mark Zaidi and Sri Patram, um, they're joining us and they will be giving us some uh, presentations and updates. I would like to also recognize Kristin Gallick, Pat Amar Hafez, and Wei Tang, who graciously um, um, allowed us to tag, him, tag them because they know a little bit more about Cupid and they offered some help for those of us who are sitting around them um, to help and move you along if you're um, a newcomer to the software. And um, there is a lot of people who provided us with their images. Um, I will tell you more on that later. And thank you all for coming and uh, wanting to learn more today that you knew yesterday. So I think about Cupid as your digital pathology workshop. And you have a picture of my workshop at home in the background. And if you were coming to Earth from a different planet, if you were an alien and didn't know the culture um, and you wanted to know how to use a hammer, think for 30 seconds about the questions that you would need to ask in order to be able to do that. You would first need to know that hammers exist. You would probably want to know about the types of hammers, what they do, where to find them, how to use it not to hurt you, um, how to use it to get what you want. Then you would have to practice a lot and you would have to think how to use that in um, your real uh, project and finally build the thing that you came up with. So our course will in involve a lot of repetition. We're gonna be cycling through certain concepts and um, um, for those of you who are a little bit more advanced, um, we also try to put some morsels of things that are going to be interesting, that are new, uh, that are fun to do. There is going to be a lot of practice. Um, there is going to be a lot of self-learning. Um, the way to learn how to hammer a nail is to use the hammer. Um, there will be quite a bit of exploration of the data, and I hope there will be lots of questions. So at the least, 
Well, we're going to get you to an expert level in buying stuff until it works. And um, with this, I would like to thank you and invite you for an introduction to Cuba Talk. My name is Michael. I work in the lab with Kevin Elisari in the snowy, wintry north of Madison, Wisconsin. And uh, my work is right now really uh, centered around 3D pathology and light sheet microscopy. So this is a little bit of a kind of stuck being back into the past for me, where I used QPath more. We still do use QPath, but it's actually integrated into our deep learning training um, pipelines and controlling our microscopes. So while we're going to be showing you QPath from the point of view of image analysis, I just want to point out that you can use it for plenty of other things as well. All right. And uh, if you guys want to use the QR code there, you can use Padlet to ask any questions anonymously. We'll get to those uh, when there are some kind of breaks. I know the uh, Wi-Fi can be a little weak right now. So, you know, do the best you can. And of course, raise your hand to ask questions at any time. Don't feel that that's the only way you need to ask questions. Oh, wrong one. OK. So. Why use QPath? Well, first of all, one thing I've heard from most of the people who've used it is just how user-friendly it is. Um, and kind of as you get started here and walk through some of the first, uh, first slides, I want you to kind of make a list of the things you like or dislike about QPath because uh, there will be, so make a list, because um, there will be a user experience session in this afternoon and having that list of questions or comments will be good, especially from people who are just being introduced to the software right now. Um, it's very collaborative software, open source and open uh, operating system. So you can use it in Mac, Linux, or PC. And since it's open source, you don't need to pay for a license. You can install it on every computer you have. And in fact, you can run it in multiple instances on whatever computers you have up to your hardware limitations. Um, it handles pyramidal whole slide images. I changed that text at the last minute because of a forum post that reminded me that it cannot still handle giant images that are not pyramidal. Um, you need them to be in a reasonable format, but if you are in one of those formats, between file formats and open slide, QPath can handle well over 100 different types of file formats, um, some better than others. It does tend to depend on how well the company has made their image format uh, accessible. There are some great overlays and visual visualization tools as shown in the GIFs in the lower left and upper right. So in the lower left, I'm looking at a fluorescence image and kind of tracing along the border of a piece of tissue and looking at all the different channels there. And then in the upper right, I have a combination of looking at the intensity of cytokeratin on the left and the distance from some blood vessels. So a lot of cool visualization tools. The annotation tools are top notch. In fact, I hear a lot of or see a lot of forum posts about people using the annotation tools in QPath and then transferring those annotations to other software, for example, for 3D rendering or training deep learning models. It has comprehensive documentation, which we'll go through more uh, in another session. And as an extension of that comprehensive documentation, there's also over 3,000 threads on the ImageSC forum you can look for for people who've already had an issue that you've had or perhaps asked a similar question. And finally, the community is pretty good, and I see uh, fairly rapid responses to most of the questions people ask on the forum, as long as they are well formatted. And QPath being open source is not an island. Uh, one of the first extensions that I remember having a really big impact was Stardust, which was added by Pete. But then since it's open source and people are able to access the code, uh, some people at Biop EFBL also uh, created the CellPose plugin from that. And so CellPose does require interacting with the Python environment, but there's also Paco, which is a Python library for interacting with QPath, fans have written. Um, most recently, there's the QPath extension for the segment anything model, which can make segmenting or sorry, annotating some things much easier. And the original uh, was ImageJ is built into uh, QPath, so you can use it um, to use a lot of the base image J functions uh, in, by calling them from QPath. And in fact, you can point to a Fiji installation and get most of the functionality, although don't expect every plugin to work. I don't know if that might be a work in progress on image J2. Yeah, maybe, maybe that'll happen in the future. So 
All right. In our first 40 minutes or so, depending on how much time he gives me after I over overrun into his talk, uh, we're going to talk about image analysis in a nutshell. I'm going to give you a kind of guided on rails um, analysis or image analysis pipeline. So, and then we're going to just go through the interface and test some of the visualization options. And as he said, I am going to repeat myself a lot. If you catch me repeating myself, that's good because that means you picked it up the first time and maybe somebody else is getting it for the first time. All right. So image analysis in the nutshell, kind of, you get images in, data out, right? Take images, put them in whatever little program you have. You're going to get some kind of an ROI, which is just an area. That ROI will have some measurements associated with it. And then you're going to turn that into a figure for your paper or whatever. QPath is very similar in this, except that it handles full slide images in addition to other standard images. They will go into the QPath factory and you'll get a couple of different types of areas out both annotations and detections. And move this out of the way a little bit. And they will all have associated measurements with them. You will do the same thing, take those measurements, make your figure. Um, again, it's just image in, data out, and remember to cite QPath. And really, any image open source image analysis software, please make sure you cite it. It helps the authors. And I guess one last thing is I want to mention that QPath is not restricted to these whole slide images. That is kind of the claim to fame currently, but it can open time series and three-dimensional images. That's what I have open there in the lower left corner. It just only renders one slice at a time. So no 3D rendering. All right. So uh, as we get started here, you guys are about to go into using QPath. So one of the first things you'll see is this little pop-up saying, hey, what kind of image are you going to drag in? And for our first test, it's going to be a bright field HDAB image. And when you get to this point and you see this pop-up, you can potentially uh, change the, let's see here, change the prompt to auto estimate. This is usually fairly accurate. The one time I've seen it fail is when your bright field images are too dim. And this is one of those things that might seem like a bug, but kind of also is a feature because if it's actually detecting your bright field images as fluorescence, that means your bright field images are too dim. I have not seen it do this on a good quality bright field image. So talk time to talk to your core or look at your bulb or change your exposure time on those images. All right. So for the following, hopefully everybody has an open copy of QPath now. A lonely empty folder if you don't. Go ahead and create an empty folder somewhere that you can access it. And within your data files, you should have an os2.ndpi. So those are the three things we'll need for this demo. And once you have those things, you're just going to drag the empty folder into QPath. You'll get a pop-up saying, do you want to create a new project for this? And you'll just click OK. Then you'll drag the os2.ndpi in the <laughs> path again. And you'll get another pop-up that will be much bigger than what's shown on screen. But all you really want to do is click that Import button. We're not going to play with any of the settings there. And then we'll see what breaks. So uh, I've run this say three times in the last week. And two of those times people had issues with IT security. In one case, you couldn't drag and drop images into QPath. So they had to use the create project button, which is an alternative. You can use create project and then go to add images, choose files, and try and target that folder, that empty folder. If that still doesn't work uh, because you can't access the location, then try using your downloads folder. That was the kind of last ditch effort to get this to work. And someone found that they could, you know, drag their empty file and their images into the downloads folder and access the whole project from there or create the project there. So is anyone having issues? Are we mostly you get a show of hands for people who have a project and an image in it? All right, change of pace. Anyone not have a project with an image in it? All right. I'm assigning. She said she. Yeah. All right. Those of you that have it working, uh, bonus points for going ahead and right clicking on the image in your project and duplicating it. There should be a. Kind of context menu that you can use. 
It's more of a project if you have multiple images, but we're really only going to use the one. This is just for you to play around with. And now I should go ahead and try and do that. Might take me a moment because I'm not used to a Mac. New folder. And you can name the folder whatever you want. All right. So I am dragging my empty folder into KeyPath, saying yes to create the empty directory project. I'm going to go into my files, raw, and somewhere in here, os2.ndpi. I'm going to drag it in here. I get the pop-up, and I'm going to import. All right. So this is the pop-up that I mentioned in the previous slide uh, and should still be on that side screen. So go ahead and click apply and I'm gonna go ahead and say, always auto estimate. Here we go. All right. Let's do that Let's do one more time, dragging them in. Most people are good here. Hope so. All right. While anyone else finishes getting themselves set up, I'll go a little bit through the interface. It has three main parts. There's the top bar, um, which may look a little bit different if you're on a map, because the menus will be along the top of your screen. Uh, but essentially that is very similar to the Fiji interface where you have a set of menus that have sometimes a lot of options and submenus and submenus. And then there's a bunch of interactive tools and buttons along the top. So right there. Um, and these are the visualization tools, which we'll go through later. There's the analysis pane on the left, um, which consists of a variety of tabs. And then the viewer, um, is the main area where you see your image. We'll refer to, refer to the viewer a lot and talk about hotkey focus as well. There are some hotkeys like changing the display, which you can do with the number keys, like one, two, three, four, five, which will only work if you're actually in the viewer. So, uh, and making a quick note here, um, these are all tools here are all exclusive. So the toggle is only one option at a time. Okay. Yeah. Oh, I don't have a slip. Nope. All right, my next QPath just to demonstrate the focus. If I go ahead and click into this window here and press two, it's changing the view. Press three, changing the view. Press one, changing the view back. And if I click over here into the analysis pane and press two, no matter how many times I angrily press two, it doesn't do anything. So when you see this sort of thing happen or you're expecting something to happen in the viewer and it doesn't, it's probably because you haven't clicked into the viewer to make it in focus. Okay, moving on. Um, so we're just gonna get started here with actually interacting with the interface. So this is the move tool up here in the upper left. As long as you have that selected, you can tell it's selected because it looks a little bit depressed and darkened. Um, you can kind of left click and drag and move your image around the screen. If you use the mouse wheel or two fingers on your trackpad, and you're gonna be much better off with this if you have the mouse, um, you can zoom in and out and then drag around the screen. And if you have any other tool selected, the, the space bar is kind of your like safety option. You don't want to accidentally draw and you have a drawing tool selected. You can always hold down the space bar and then click and drag and it will safely use 
the uh, move tool effectively. Finally, the other safe option to move is using the overview. So that's the overview up here. You can click around inside the overview, especially when you're zoomed in, and move to that position in the view. So I'm going to go ahead and do that now. So if I go ahead and zoom in, you can see this little red box here indicating where I am in the image. And I can go ahead and click on a different part, and I will move to that part. Again, mouse wheel or touchpad to zoom in and out and then just left click and drag to move. Hopefully all on board with that. All right. Now, one last check before we get started. Your image does need to be HDAB. Um, the image pane contains a lot of information. I'll go through this again later about the particular image you have open. In this case, the most important thing is just that it's bright field HDAB. The color vectors will need to be set as default for all of the stuff that I'm about to do to work. And again, this should have worked fine, but just in case it didn't, double check, look in that image tab, and make sure. If you ever need to change it, let's say you've accidentally imported as fluorescence, you can double click where it says bright field HDAB, and you'll get that same pop-up menu that you saw earlier, and you can change it. Oops. All right, so an overview of what we're about to do. We are going to just do an on-rails um, analysis here. We're gonna create a thresholder. We are then going to perform some cell detection within that thresholded area. We're gonna create a single measurement classifier just to classify the cells. And then we're gonna create your first script, just all very much on-rails. If you kind of get lost and are looking for a particular function, you don't see, you didn't see where I clicked or something like that, there's the command search. So you can use control L or open Apple L, command L, to go ahead and bring up a little text window where you can type in and it will show you possible commands that include that text. And you can then double click on those to run that particular function. Our goals here are just to do a thing quickly and get you into QPath. We're not actually doing a real analysis. We're not gonna understand every setting. This is just to kind of walk you through the motions and get you through a first project or first analysis which isn't a real analysis. Uh, if anyone is gonna be bored with this, your experience with QPath, feel free to go ahead and open the Luca 7 multi-fluorescence image, or multi-channel fluorescence image, and do a whole image annotation, segment into tumor and stroma, create some cells, and create a composite classifier for all six classes, just for fun. But at the same time, if you see anyone around you struggling and your experience, go ahead and help them out. All right, last check for technical difficulties. Is everyone have a project, have an image open, ready to go. All right, let's see if this is the... Uh, oh, I should have been skipping through this more. All right, so um, we're not gonna actually do color deconvolution here. That would actually insert a bit of variance into this that I didn't want, but for breakfield images, you should always start with color deconvolution step. Um, QPath's built-in color vectors, and we'll go into this more in a later presentation, are pretty good, but they're not going to be right for you. In fact, they're pretty much always going to be wrong. Um, every scanner is going to be a little bit different in terms of its uh, uh, light intensity. It's going to be different. Uh, your samples are going to be different in terms of the staining. You're going to have batch effects from your different stains. So always um, check your color deconvolution before you go into any break field analysis. All right, so we're into the on-rails portion. We're going to create a tissue outline-ish. We're not going to outline the entire tissue here because that would make the cell detection step take a little bit too long. But first, you're going to go up to classify, pixel classification, create thresholder. And potentially, you could use the just control L and type in create thresholder and access it that way. That should give you a the uh, dialog shown in number two where you're gonna change these values. You're gonna make the channel hematoxylin. You're gonna set a smoothing sigma to three, a threshold to 0 0.16. You're gonna set the above threshold class to other. And then you can call the classifier whatever you want. I just went ahead and called it tissue. And then you need to save. Until you save, these will likely be grayed out, so you can't use them. 
So that's why this is ordered. Do the red stuff first, then save, then click Create Objects. Once you click Create Objects, you will likely get a pop-up. Just go ahead and click OK for that. Just We're telling QPath that we want to run this across the entire image. And finally, you will get this Create Objects uh, pop-up. The only values we're changing here is setting the minimum object size to 1 million. So that's one and then six zeros. And we're going to check set new objects to selected and then click OK. So I believe this is all showing on the secondary monitor. So I'm going to go ahead and do it here. All right, so classify, create thresholder, channel metoxylin, smoothing sigma three, threshold leave with 0 0.16. Above threshold, I'm just going to go ahead and select other. And at this point, you can see that there's an overlay showing. And I'm going to call this tissue. And as you can see, these all are grayed out right now, so I can't create objects. So I'm going to save. And the moment I save, I can now create objects. I'm going to do this for the full image. I'm going to have a minimum object size of 1 million. And set those new objects to selected. And click OK. And at that point, I'm going to go ahead and close the Create Thresholder, which will get rid of this overlay. And if I zoom out, I can see the objects I've created. All right. Does anybody not have a tissue outline? Ideally, though, this should be what you have. If you go ahead and click on the annotations pane in the, on the left side up there in the center, you should see that you have an annotation. In the viewer, you should also see that you have an annotation that looks something like this, if you followed all the steps exactly. Um, and if you kind of double click in the empty space, you'll see that it will change color. This will be either yellow or orange, depending on whether or not you have it selected and whether or not you have the default object colors set. But you'll see that uh, if you either double click outside and then double click back inside, the object is either selected or unselected. Uh, a couple other things to note, the object will be started. Uh, when it's created, it is locked by default. You can see this little locked icon here. That means you can't accidentally double click on it and drag it when it's selected. If you do not have that lock icon on it, you can generally grab annotations and drag them around your image. So kind of a warning to be careful with that. Additionally, the image has not been modified in any way. What we're looking at is just an overlay. This is a picture on top of a picture. Uh, it represents some area of your data, but QPath in general does not modify your images, really ever, except unless you export them as something different. So everything you see on top of your image is literally just that on top of your image, not actually part of it. All right, next step, we're gonna add some cells. Let's see, am I getting this right now? There we go. Adding some cells. So if we go to the Analyze menu, Cell Detection, Cell Detection, we are then going to just kind of uh, change only two settings here. We're going to change hematoxylin to optical density sum. We are going to change the requested pixel size to two. And this kind of has to do with the fact that these images are pyramidal. So rather than loading all the data from the lowest level, which we would be doing if we use 0 0.5, we're going to be using kind of some lower resolution data, which will make the pixel classifier run faster because it has to load less data. Kind of wanted to make a joke here about Fast and the Furious, but I couldn't find a way to uh, really fit it in. So opportunity lost. Uh, once you've got that set, you can go ahead and click Run. 
depending on whether or not you had your annotation selected or unselected when you finished playing around with the annotation in the previous slide, you may get a pop-up that you have to click OK. If it's already selected, QPath will default assume that that's what you want to run the cell detection on. If not, it'll ask you, do you want to run this on annotations? And you just say yes. And once you have that run, you should get something like this. I'm going to give everyone a moment to do that while I run it on the laptop. Analyze, cell detection, cell detection. Change hematoxyl into optical density sum. Change the requested pixel size to two. And run. All right. And then you can go ahead and close the cell detection window and take a look at your cells. Okay. Yes. For that requested pixel size, how accurate do you need to do about the designating that? So, so like if our pixel size is point one seven, like that. It will snap to the nearest multiple of whatever your default pixel size is. So you can't use partial pixels, right? Sound right? I think it'll resize and so it tries to match exactly with what you've got. So right. they don't have to rescale, so interpret it. So it will do like half pixels if you. Uh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, so it doesn't have to match with what okay. is actually present in the image. We can just put like 0.5 and it will rescale the image. Oh, no, I mean, but you can't do like. Uh, down sample like three and a half. Yeah, you oh, you can. Okay. So yeah, you might do better if you have an exact multiple then. I thought you said it snaps to at some point. So snap to multiple is going to be a pixel to default pixel size. Okay. 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 Um, no, I think it will try and resize so that that actually is the pixel size in your image. Even if it's not even. Even if it's not even, yeah. Okay. All right, Let's see where we were at in the presentation. It's great that. So the idea is that you could have images with different scanners and one is a pixel size of 0.25 microns per pixel and one is 0.3 and one is 0.4. But if you put in 0.5 in there, then it should rescale them all to the same scale. So all the parameters should kind of work. Might not work because it could be different colors from the different scanners, but yes. at least it will try and make it as similar as it can. All right, moving right along, get some class. All right, so uh, if you go up to classify and other, sorry, object classification and create single measurement classifier, where you know you use the control L, command L to type in create single measurement, either way, we should get to this uh, single measurement classifier window. Go ahead and change the channel to DAB. And that should, by default, change the uh, measurement to DAB mean. Select a value of 0 0.4. Set your above to positive and your below to negative. And then go ahead and click apply. This is a KI67 slide. All of the uh, staining is nuclear. So we're just doing a very simple, simple threshold here. And anyone who's a pathologist or knows their tumor staining uh, can go ahead and pick out probably better thresholds. But yeah, I just picked one where it can show a strong uh, contrast in terms of the number of cells that are classified. Okay. So yes. Maybe you can go back to QPath and um, show them from the um, moment of opening the image, create the classifier, get the cell detection going. All right. Let's go ahead and objects. Delete all objects here. All right. So I'm going to go to analyze, sorry, no, classify, pixel classification. Create thresholder. 
Uh, these values have already been added, but uh, you can see that I chose the hematoxylin channel. Smoothing sigma of three, threshold of 0 0.16, and an above threshold of class of other. Go ahead and save that again and overwrite my tissue classifier. And I'm going to create objects for most of these regions here, but I don't want to create a ton of. Uh oh. Okay, there we go. Little image. I don't want to kind of create objects for all of these little areas here, so I'm setting a minimum object size of a million. And that's something you just kind of have to get used to. You can create little test annotations to figure out like what the approximate size of an object you want to exclude is. But for now, we're just trusting that I pick something fairly useful. And once I have that done, we can go ahead and analyze cell detection, cell detection. And again, I'm going to change this to optical density sum because the DAB staining in some of these uh, cells is pretty, uh, pretty heavy and can block the hematoxylin signal. Change the requested pixel size to two so that this can run faster. Click run. And now I have cells. If I go ahead and classify object classification, create single measurement classifier, I get this pop-up window that I think is still visible on the far monitor. I'm going to select DAB, type in a value of 0 0.4, nope. Low threshold, positive, low threshold, negative, the moment I hit live preview, I can see that these objects are changing color. If I zoom in and kind of take a look at that. Um, and I'm going to go ahead and hit apply, since again, this is just on Rails. To make sure that these or to make these cells more visible and easy to see like what's positive and negative, I want to make sure that first off, the detections are visible themselves, that the detections are filled in. And then I'm going to go ahead and right click cells. There are a variety of different ways you can view these cells, but if you use either nuclei only or cell boundaries only, you can see right now with nuclei and cell boundaries, they're kind of, they're still semi-transparent. But if I go to cell boundaries only, they become opaque and it becomes a lot easier to see patterns and stuff when you zoom in and out. Yes. So when you say that my object is all selected yellow and I, I can see the outlines of Cells, but... If you have still the overlay, um, first thing you can do is press C or turn off the overlay with the C button here, or you can close the um, pixel classifier window. If you still see it, that means you still have the pixel classifier dialog open, okay. the thresholder. Yep, right. Thank so you. once you close that, that it will work. All right. Here. Moving right along. So if we were to, if you now go to the annotations tab, click on your annotation, you should see near the bottom of the annotation tab, a list of measurements. These are your summary measurements. I like to kind of describe the annotations themselves as buckets. They're just an object that really holds other objects or other measurements. And I tend to use them as summary, summary measurements. Maybe not the best analogy, but I guess it pales in comparison to some uh, Yeah, so you should have like a density percent positive, number positive, number negative. All right. Now, if you had 100 images, would you want to manually do those steps over and over again? Maybe not. All right, so what if I give you a cheat sheet? It's a cheat sheet over there, right? Still now. Comfortable chair a lot of time. Uh, okay, so QPath has scripting built in. And if you go to the workflow tab, you will see a list of the commands that you just ran. And assuming everyone has followed all the commands once, this will be very simple. If you've had to go back and forth a few times, this might end up getting a little bit tricky. But if you go up to workflow, create script, you should see something like this pop up. And go ahead and save it using the file menu. <coughs> Mm 
once you have that script saved, we're going to simulate real life because things happen. Lose data, cat steps on the keyboard, and you delete things. So let's delete all of our objects by going to Objects, Delete, Delete All Objects, and wipe out everything we've done for the last 5, 10, 15 minutes. And this is just a reminder to always save your scripts. The uh, workflow tab is kind of like your lab notebook. It has a list of all the things you've done and tried. Um, and it's a lot smaller than your data file. So you can make 50 backups of it for the size of one data file and store them different places. And then as long as you have your image and you have your script, you kind of know what you've done. And at this point, you can run it. So take that script, go to run, run, or all the way at the bottom here in the dialog, you can click run. And that's it. You've regenerated all that stuff we just did. Um, now, there may be problems here, again, depending on how cleanly you follow the steps. If everybody just did each step once, it should just run. If not, you may have to take a look at your, um, take a look at that workflow in the scripting tab and delete some lines. Uh, so if you're in the scripting window here, there should be either a run up in the uh, menus at the top, and that might be on the Mac all the way at the top, or there should be down at the bottom a run button in the uh, at the lower right hand corner. If you saved it, hmm? so like, uh, unless you accidentally closed the script editor, but you did save it. Ah, you save. Oh, well, actually, it doesn't matter if you close the, close the script editor and you saved it or or you saved it. There is a script icon. So let me go ahead and switch back over to QPath and hide this again. So if I open the script editor from here. So there's just this nice icon, which conveniently has the same icon as the way you format your scripts when you post them on the image SC forum. You can get your script back. So what I did here is go to workflow, create script, and I ran everything twice. So I'm going to go ahead and remove half of this so that I only have one run of everything. I'm going to go up to file and save. You can call that script whatever you want. And then I'm going to go ahead and click back into the window here so I have objects menu. I'm going to delete all of my objects. Oh no, I lost my data. Um, then I'm just going to go over to my script editor, click Run. And it's thinking. And there we go. All my data is back. Anyone having issues with getting this to run? If not, you do. And you're in the right place because we have three next days to slowly move you over steps. Yes. But yeah, no, I think I think we're we're good, right? We're done. Time for lunch. <laughs> no, oh, I have to keep going. Okay, I have to keep going. Uh, recap. So we took a lonely empty folder. We dragged it into QPath and made a project. We took one of those images, well, really only one image, and we created an annotation using a thresholder. That could be done a variety of other ways using, say, a pixel classifier. You can create manual annotations, or you can just create a big block around your whole image and analyze everything inside of it. We took that annotation, we created cells in it. Those didn't have to be cells. They could be tiles, they could be spots, they could be super pixels. There's a variety of options, and you can even use the pixel classifier and thresholder again within that original thresholder annotation. That generated a set of measurements for each of those objects. We took one of those measurements and ran a classification. And that could have been a classification or spatial analysis or any other kind of measurements we could add, either using scripting or some of QPath's built-in tools. And from that classification, we got another set of measurements that we looked at from the annotation, those summary measurements. Um, I don't think I quite understand what the so classifier you got is how we're gonna create these specific annotations. Uh, so we didn't actually use a 
Well, it's we use the pixel classifier, but technically there's a pixel classifier and a thresholder. The pixel classifier uses machine learning. The thresholder was just yeah, yeah. we smeared the hematoxylin signal a little, and we said, okay, where's their dense hematoxylin signal? Oh, I see. Okay. Yeah. The idea was just to get in a and in using the thresholder, we don't need to train anything, so I don't need to rely on people having different training yeah. data. So it was a very simple way of making sure everyone got the same thing. Yes. And kept it relatively small so we weren't spending 15 yeah. minutes generating cells. Yeah. All right. What is a project? In general, a project is just a folder holding a bunch of files together that relate your images to the data. They a lot of you had the problem that you did not create a project. Okay. Do create projects. You're gonna like it. Believe it. Oh wow. Okay, yes. Um always create a project. So that folder keeps all, all these kind of um, folders and data files together. So when you created that classifier for your um, thresholder, or when you created that object classifier that detects cells as positive or negative, you can find that in the classifiers folder. Similarly, the all the objects we created, once you saved your data. You can find that in the data folder. Um, resources is a new one. I think it mostly contains brightness and contrast settings, but maybe there are some other things. Yeah. Room to grow. And then your script will probably have ended up in the scripts folder. Uh, the QP project file is what um, QPath is looking for. So if you want to open your project again, you can drag that folder into the QPath window just to reopen it. Uh, you could also potentially just drag the QP Proj folder into your QPath window and open it, but QPath will just look for a QP Proj folder in the folder that you drag in. Yes. I use based on best practices in setting the best set thresholds. Best Not in this lecture. <laughs> okay. That's later. There was a question about um, non nuclear staining. We will be covering that. Okay. All right. And so these are the ones that are reserved for QPath. You will generally see QPath auto-generate these, and I just want to emphasize not to touch them unless you're a lot more experienced with QPath, or at least until you gained a lot of experience. If you rename one of these, like call this my data, it will break all of your connections. QPath is really expecting most of these file names. On the other hand, you can add as many other things to this folder as you want. I usually have all of my data exports go into this folder so I can keep everything together. Um, and so you can also drag your images into it if you want, basically, as long as you don't mess with this reserved stuff, you'll be fine. So check that, add whatever you want. And this is an actual example of a folder where I was testing exports. Yeah, I'm not going to judge any of you for how messy your folders are either. Um, so yes, it is another bucket analogy with full files with information about your images. All right. So, uh. What we did was we created a project. We dragged some images in, or just one image. Uh, that's the easiest way to get your images into a QPath project. There are some advanced in, um, options, like you can use a text file generated by Python to access images across a network in various places, or you can create projects in the command line. We're not going to discuss that, but I just want to mention for the more advanced users that that is possible. You're not restricted to just drag and drop. So we have our projects. We contained added some images. <coughs> These images contain objects. Well, actually, the images, again, aren't being modified. The data file contains objects. There are two main types. Uh, annotations are your big, malleable bucket areas. Uh, they can be either locked or unlocked. You can adjust them manually if they're unlocked. And you can create them manually or, as we saw, automatically. And Z is going to be going into a lot more information on annotations next. They generally kind of contain your summary annotations for export. Detections, on the other hand, those are your cells, the small fixed objects. You cannot edit these. Once they are created, they are just there. And uh, generally, these will be created by QPath. You don't have the option to use the one tool or something to create a detection. They are they exist that way because they are low-strain for the computer. And while QPath might struggle with, say, 10,000, 100,000 annotations, it will be fine, usually, depending on your hardware, with you know hundreds of thousands of cells. And they usually require an annotation, so it's Annotation first, create some detections inside of it. So project, it contains images, and those images have objects. Next, this is going to be a little bit more complicated. The hierarchy is the way that the objects are related to each other. So you can have objects essentially inside of other, other objects or below other objects. Uh, the idea is to keep a relationship between the objects with each other. In our very simple example, we had one other annotation with a bunch of cells inside of it. 
So those cells were all child objects of the other annotation. But if you had a more complicated situation where you had a tissue and then maybe tumor and non-tumor areas, you could tell which cells were in the tumor areas by associating kind of backwards along this tree. In this particular example, this is what the hierarchy tab looks like. I have a whole slide annotation followed by a tissue annotation. And you can tell what is a direct child because this is these numbers here. Um, the first number indicates the number of direct children, and then that's the number of total objects within the area. So the uh, tissue annotation here has two direct child objects, the tumor and the stroma, and then a bunch of other cells. So again, just relationship and useful to keep in mind when you export your data and are analyzing it. So project contains some images. We have some objects that are in a hierarchy. Finally, we have object measurements. So one of the main measurements, or the first measurement you'll usually see is keeping track of which image a particular object is in. And that's because when you export your data across a variety of images, you will want to know which image a particular object is associated with. We're not going to really go into object IDs other than to mention that if you export your data into a CSV file for all of your objects, you could do other processing and other software outside, like do some kind of clustering in Python, and then use the object ID to re-import that data back into the correct objects. Um, the name is usually just the type of object or the classification of the object by default, but you can use it more creatively. For example, if you're associated, you import a, an atlas for, uh, it's like a brain atlas, and you overlay that onto your image, you can have all those annotations named after the various parts of the brain, so you can see that a cell has a parent that is the hippocampus or something like that. Class is kind of an awkward word because it means a lot of different things to different people. But in this case, you can just think of it as a label or a tag on a set of objects. It's a string that you just a name, and you're saying all these objects are related because they all have that same string. Parents is going to be the thing above it. So we saw that in the hierarchy. The ROI you don't really need to worry about, but it can be useful for scripting. And then there's going to be a bunch of other measurements. So and at this moment, I'm going to um, let them absorb this and tell you that if you are on Edgerome and it doesn't work, try LGI guest. Password is institute. Password is institute. All lowercase. Give it a try and see what you got. LGI guest. Yeah, it's not Yeah, it's Well, you can have like a can you show them? Yeah. All right. You know, so Please normal day. technical difficulties. Um, with technical difficulties. Please go to eat. All right. So yes, projects, images, objects, and they have some measurements. Usually there will be fewer measurements for your annotations and a lot more measurements for your detections. So this is where I would pause and say on a scale of one to cat, how is everyone doing? Hold up your fingers. Come on, see if we get some threes and sixes or not that finger, Sarah. Um, <laughs> Yeah. So can I ask a general question about recommended organization and, and what you can and cannot do within a, a project sure. folder? So if you create a project, is it recommended to store those images that you will be analyzing for that project in that project folder and then have the files for the data in there all in one place? Or do you keep the images separately? Like, it really depends. Um, I used to be a big fan of keeping the uh, image files all within the projects. I also like the idea of making a super folder because uh, if you have your project and your images separately, it makes it a lot easier to duplicate your project as a backup. You can just right click on it and copy or zip it. And that backs up all of your data without having to copy all of those image files. I see. And that's also something I prefer to do when creating training data for some of the um, machine learning classifiers is duplicate the projects without duplicating the images, create all of your training data in one project, and then copy those classifiers into the main project so that when you run one of those scripts for all of the images in your project, you don't overwrite and delete all of your training data. So, yes. And it will also depend on like where your images are if you're hosting them on a network, and it can be kind of tricky. So, And if you happen to like reorganize and move the image file say on your computer. You'll get a scary pop-up that says where is this image and you'll have to find it. And you'll just have to redirect it. Okay, yes. great. Let's see. All right. So um 
Now we're going to explore the QPath interface. I'm going to quickly go through the preferences, interacting with QPath, look at the analysis pane tabs, do a little bit of visualization, and then use buttons until so he kicks me off. So yes, please do interrupt me if you have any questions. Preferences. So preferences are up here. Yep, right there. And if you can't find it because there's too many buttons on QPath or your window is too small, you may have to click here to get a drop down and then find the annotation or the preferences there. So in terms of preferences, I just wanted to mention a few of my favorite. First of all, if you go into objects, you can change the default object colors. I will frequently do this. For example, the default red does not show up very well on each and e stains. So I will change that to cyan very quickly. A um, couple other fun ones. If you found that when you're trying to zoom in, out, zoom in and out in QPath that it's backwards, you can go ahead and change that with the invert scrolling. You can type invert and look for that. Uh, I am using light mode just because I think it's easier to see for presenting, but I always switch back to dark mode when I am just working on my own. Uh, one of the first things I change in any QPath installation or setup is making the font size huge for all the information around the bottom of the screen. Getting old, eyes aren't great. Um, and finally, if I'm doing a lot of, say, drawing a particular type of annotation, uh, by default, I think QPath will jump back to the move tool. So you draw a square, it goes back to the move tool, draw a square, goes back to the move tool. If you don't want to do that, you can turn that off and they allow you to draw a square, 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 square. In that case, it does become very important to remember the holding down the space bar so that you don't draw when you are trying to move around. All right, exploring your images. These are your two types of visualization tools. Brightness and contrast is for changing your image and how you see the image itself. And then these tools right here are for changing the visibility of everything inside the image. So uh, these are all the keyboard shortcuts for the various tools. Remember that you do probably need to be focused inside the viewer to use those. But you should all have some objects right now, so you can go and play with that, um, see what turning on and off the annotations. Names only show up if you've um, manually created a name, so the default names don't show up. This is the TMA grid. We're not going into that. Detections off and on, whether or not you want to fill in your detections. And then we did get a little bit of this earlier, where you can turn on and off the uh, pixel classifiers. And then this is just an opacity bar. So that controls pretty much everything, with the one exception being the object you currently have selected. Selected objects will always show up. Uh, next, visualizing images. When you click on that half moon, you will get this brightness and contrast window. This was more interesting probably when you have a multiplex image, which we'll get into more later. But if you press the various numerical keys, you will see that the display changes to show you either the hematoxylin channel the DAB channel, or you can look at the optical density sum. And if you look at view channel viewer, you can see all of those at once. So we'll quickly show that. So if I have these opaque overlays, I can grab the slider here and kind of see the image behind them. I can turn them off entirely or on the cells by changing the detection toggle. And if I go to the brightness and contrast, I can either click on the various types of image. And I'm going to go ahead and turn the cells off so we can see that better. So this is a different color to convolution channels. And if I press the number two, I can toggle back and forth between the full image and just the, uh, the hematoxylin channel. Or if I press three to go to the DAB channel and then press one, I'm jumping back to the original full image. All right. Interacting with your image, this is just a review. So uh, again, if you left click and drag, you can move around the image, zoom in and out using the mouse wheel or two fingers and drag on your touchpad. You can click again on the overview to move around within your image. And if you were to select a drawing tool like Brush, you can always use the space bar to move around the image anyway. And this is going to go into more information about the annotation tool later. The analysis pane. Do we have time for the analysis pane? Sure. All right. So analysis pane doesn't have to be there. 
If you go ahead and click on this button in the upper left-hand corner, you can get a lot of breathing room to look at your image. This can be very nice at times. On the other hand, it does have useful information. And if you have multiple monitors, which I'm assuming most people don't have right now, you can um, right-click on the uh, tabs and undock them and move them over to a second monitor and still have the full view, which can be nice if you're doing manual annotations. All right, first tab was the project tab. So this is in the, uh, that, in the pane. Um, you have, this is where you can duplicate or remove entries. You can only remove an entry if you don't currently have it open, but you can kind of take images out of your project. You can rename them. Sometimes some things like, oh, let's go ahead. How do you redog it? Uh, I remember, just close it, yeah. Uh, all right, so you can rename the files, and again, this can help uh, with some of the bioformats imports. You get really long file names for the different series and stuff. Uh, there is metadata and sorting. I'm not going into it right now, but you can kind of create a tree structure. So if you have like three samples from patient one, three samples from patient two, and you want to kind of have a tree for that, you can separate that out. Um, and this is also where you access the project folder. So if you have multiple image analysis projects and you're like, I exported my data to the project folder, but I don't Oh, it's like way down a, pro a tree of all different all my different projects. You can right click, open directory, and go straight to the project folder right there. Um, additionally, there is a masking option, so you can hide image names if you want to reduce bias. Unfortunately, it still shows the uh, the thumbnail, so it's not perfect. But you can see the tissue. You kind of might know whether or not it's positive or negative control. All right, uh, the image tab. So this is one of the most important ones to look at when you're at the uh, beginning of your project. And the most important value here is the pixel width and height. Um, a lot of the built-in in, um, tools in QPath use that pixel width and height to estimate things like the size of a cell. That's why when we were running the cell detection, we didn't have to mess with a lot of those different values because most cells, you know, assuming you're not using analysis on an ostrich egg or something, are about the same size. And so the same kind of settings can work for expecting an object of that size. It's converting your pixels into uh, actual units of measurement, which means that, let's see, another way to put this, if your cell is like, a cell could be 100 pixels across or five. But if you have that pixel size metadata, you can be like, okay, we want to just analyze this number of cells, or number of pixels, because we're expecting a cell of a certain size. So you want that metadata to exist. If you just have pixels, you're going to run into trouble. And I mean, it's not that you can't use them, but it's trickier. Uh, the server type. This is mostly in case uh, you have issues opening your image. If you get weird behavior or the, you get an image error, you may need to change the server type. Um, it's also the most important thing to note if you're having image problems when you report uh, that on the forum. Um, it's also fixed on import. You can't just go ahead and double click and change it. So you'd have to remove the image and then re-add the image. And within that first import window, there is the option to choose the server type. The image type, on the other hand, can be changed at any time. You can just double click on that, like we saw earlier with look, making sure that something was the DAB window or DAB image. All right, uh, stains in background, these you can double click to edit, or there will be better ways to change them, which we'll discuss later. Okay, uh, annotation tab, you'll see, hierarchy tab, uh, workflow tab, the only thing I want to mention here is that in addition to creating the scripts, you can like right click on these and copy individual commands out, or you can double click on one of them to reopen. So if I wanted to change just one setting in the cell detection, I could just double click on the cell detection, it'll pop that window back up, and I can modify it a little bit. 